All right. Thank you guys for coming out tonight to the 2021, I have to make sure I got that number right, the 2021 MH Awards Night. This is our third annual MH Awards Night. We weren't able to do one last year because of, uh, because of COVID, but um, we're excited to get to see some great projects, see some great work that has been done uh, this year with our, with our Mastery with Honors projects. So uh, to begin with, my name is Brandon Schumann. I'm the Dean of Arts and Humanities here at Midland Classical Academy, and with me is AJ Perea, who is the Dean of uh, Dark Arts and Sciences. <laughs> The real, uh, the real um, feature of tonight are the students and the, the Mastery of Honors projects that they uh, have, have done. And so before we begin, uh, I'll pray and then begin to cast a vision for what, what tonight's about and then let the students uh, come up and present. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for uh, the world that you've made um, and all that is in it and for the opportunities that you give us as uh, co-creators with you uh, to discover uh, things in this world and to make things in this world. God, you are the, the creator and the master of, of all, but you have given us the talents to, uh, to build, to think, to, to learn and discover, and I thank you for the students that are here at Midland Classical Academy and the opportunities that they have had to uh, explore uh, this universe that you've made in, in so many different ways, whether it's through through arts or through science or math um, and just uh, language, just so many different ways, Lord. And God, I pray that tonight you would be honored in the presentations of the work that they have done, and I pray that these students would be honored in the work that they have done, uh, reflecting your glory. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So like MCA, uh, Mastery with Honors are really the embodiment of what our slogan or our vision is at Midland Classical Academy of Engaging Minds, Pursuing Christ, and Discovering Greatness. Uh, Mastery with Honors projects are part of Engaging Minds because they use and they grow our different faculties and cause us to question assumptions, consider big ideas, and, and grapple with challenging tasks. Uh, they are part of Pursuing Christ because they are honoring to God and uh, and often have a service component uh, with, the, with the projects. And then, and then obviously they're a part of discovering greatness because they're the products of the best that we can give. And so MH projects, as you guys have looked around and seen, um, are, are seldom similar. Um, measuring them to one another is not comparing apples to apples or even apples to oranges, but Mr. Curry and I often uh, say that it's, it's comparing apples to kumquats. Um, and so, the, the way these projects have come together, how we've selected uh, the, the five winners, part of the, the MH awards process is we had 104 MH projects that were submitted and turned into their tutors this year. And then we asked tutors to nominate projects that they thought stood out, uh, that exemplified the, the character qualities and things that we, uh, that I'll talk about in a minute of discovery, wonder, imagination, and arete and present those to, to Mr. Korea and I. And then so we had probably about 30, 35 projects that were submitted to us. And then we had the unenviable task of trying to narrow those down um, so the judges could uh, come up here and, and actually focus and select on um, which, which projects were the winners. And so we narrowed it down to a field of 20 projects. And then we invited four community leaders that uh, don't have a dog in the hunt uh, just to come up here and analyze the, the projects. Um, on a Monday night, and so they came up here and spent uh, the better part of three hours just looking at uh, all of the of the 20 projects that were that were nominated. And so our judges were Dan Thatcher, who was a former MCA tutor. Uh, he was kind of a switch hitter back in his day, where he taught all the hard math science classes and all the the hard um, humanities classes of, of Greek three. You know, we had that class back in the day. Um, Greek 3 and Great Books 4. Um, and then uh, 
He's also the father of Noah Thatcher and Hannah Thatcher and Tori Thatcher, who all graduated from, from MCA. And Hannah came back and was a tutor here for a number of years. And then we also had Caleb Weatherill, um, who was an outstanding student in 2005 from, uh, from Midland Classical. Uh, was a Harvard grad, um, and then was the brother of, of Josh, Jordan, and Grace Weatherill. Um, Caleb would have been a judge um, the first couple of years we were doing this, but um, uh, his sister um, was in the running for several projects, so we couldn't, couldn't rope him in. And then Randy Stallings uh, was another judge. She's a stay-at-home mom um, and was an outstanding student at Midland Classical and graduated from here in 2009. Uh, she's an A&M grad, and she's the husband of, of Tyler Stallings, uh, who served um, in the military, and they recently moved back to, to Midland. And then uh, Daryl Jensen, uh, who is um, an engineer for Honeywell and was a, one of the co-founders of the MCA Robotics uh, Program. So, uh, so those were our four judges, and they um, donated a, a good chunk of their time to come up here and really investigate and sink in and, and get to, to learn about these these students' projects, and so they just ranked their projects um, uh, one to ten, and then we, uh, Mr. Free, tabulated the, the results, and, and that's how we we got got what we got tonight. So uh, tonight, uh, as the MH Awards night, is really about two things. Uh, first, it's about the students and their achievements. Uh, we've come to recognize the uh, the greatness that they've discovered um, through their honors projects. And not, not only the, the students that are coming up here that we're, we're recognized tonight in the, in the different categories of, of winners, but, but really all the, the MH projects that have been done. And so a um, little bit of audience participation. Um, if you submitted an MH project this year, uh, would, you, would you stand up so we can recognize you? So, um, in sports, it's often easy to, to see and recognize the effort and talent. Um, it was fun coming out uh, to the baseball game on Friday night, getting to see Gabe hit his, his, his walk-off double um, with, with two outs in the bottom of the eighth and in extra innings. And so it's easy sometimes to see that greatness in sports and, and come up to, to a game. But a lot of the greatness that's done in academics uh, we get to see in the classroom as tutors, or your, your students get to see that uh, amongst their peers, but, but even within that, it's often regulated to just room 11, or room 4, or room 2. And, and there's a lot of great things that are going on in the, the academic realm at, at MCA. And so what we wanted to do with this, this night was to kind of give a chance to let this be the playoffs, or, or district, or, or whatever. Um, so, so that way we can recognize the, the great things that are being done by your students and by your classmates and, and the great work that you have done, um, students, uh, to, to celebrate that because what you've done is worth celebrating. And so that's, that's the first thing that tonight is about, is recognizing those projects. Um, but another element of it too is, is it's really for all of us um, to come up to that this night is about all of us and getting to see the greatness that, that students have done because greatness inspires greatness. Uh, we hope that as you're seeing what your students have done and what your classmates have done, that you will be inspired to be great in the things that matter to you. Um, not all of us have um, the, the talent that our students demonstrate through these projects, whether it's through art or through science or computer programs, but uh, God has made all of us to be great in, in certain, in, in something. And so there are things in your life that God is calling you to be great at, whether it's your work, um, your, your relationships, or, or your hobbies. And so there's something in that, that when you see greatness in, in something else, even if it's nothing that you have that talent in, it can, it can awaken some greatness within, within your own life. And so we hope that you come tonight and, uh, and get to be inspired by that. Uh, a lot of the, the great classics that we, that we read here, um, whether it's Homer or Virgil or, or uh, uh, John, Jonathan Milton, uh, they begin these classics with sing, O muse. And what the muse was in ancient literature, it was, it was this, this spirit that would just come and inspire and awaken this sense of greatness. 
And so, um, so they, these authors would begin singing O Muse and, and just calling on this muse to, to inspire them to, do, to give their best effort towards the, the, the thing that they were about to write about or, or sing. And so with that, we hope that you are um, not amused tonight, but that you are also amused through, through the, the things that you, that you see and recognize. And so um, the four categories that we have, so this is the criteria that all the projects were, were based off of, um, and you, you see them on your, um, on your program, are wonder, imagination, discovery, and arte. And so giving a little bit of a definition and maybe a flavor of what those things mean, because that's, that's all we give the judges is that, and we say go, um, is wonder is the, the idea that the project was born out of a love for learning, um, a deep love and respect for the student, um, or from the student was evident, um, that the project raised big questions and pursued some of them. Um, and so wonder, what, what that is, is that's a, a cultural value at NCA. And what wonder does is it invites us to something beyond just the superficial. Mm -hmm. Wonder invites us to lean in and see who um, and what is behind the beauty. And uh, wonder really leads to worship. Uh, the second thing is imagination. And so the student uh, was creative and innovative in their the project demonstrates fresh thinking that does not settle for boilerplate answers. Uh, it challenges assumptions. And uh, two of the, the greatest thinkers in history is the verses of um, my philosophical homeboy, Soren Kierkegaard, whose face is on my, my um, door over there. He's a great book score philosopher. Um, and then Albert Einstein. They both said that imagination is more important than intelligence. Um, uh, Kierkegaard said that imagination is the greatest faculty. And so with these projects, they're not just this run of the mill, here's, here's your textbook answer, that you can really see the imagination at work in these projects. Uh, the third category was discovery. Um, and so discovery is, is simply what the student learned, um, both in an academic sense, but also in a practical sense. And so this discovery could be new insights or deeper understanding of the subject, a better connections of how this subject or material relates to, to other um, things in their life, other, other bodies of knowledge or, or ways that it can be applied. And, and really what discovery is, is that's the heart of all learning. And then this fourth category is this fun word um, called arete. And arete is the Greek word for virtue or excellence. And what arete is, is it's, a, it's an inspiring degree of, of, of excellence. It's a, when you see arete, you're just like, I'm, you can recognize that you're in the presence of greatness or a great performance was, was just given. Um, so arete is the thing that you get when the, uh, a starting pitcher gets, the, gets a complete game shutout or a no hitter and, and the, the applause that they get when they leave the field. And so you just recognize that was a great moment. And so, that's what we're hoping that you see in these projects tonight, and that's what we ask our um, judges to, to measure off of, with, in addition to wonder, imagination, discovery, was also this idea of arte, which is a wow factor. Um, there's a care and craftsmanship. Um, an impressive amount of effort was spent in the intricate details and overall design or effect of the, of the MH project. And so that was the, the criteria. And so with, with all of those things, um, uh, we are excited for tonight, we're excited for these students, we're excited to get to honor them uh, and the work that they've done. And, uh, and one last kind of housekeeping thing before we start going into the, to, to, to our winners is to let you guys know that as we have our students come up here and present, um, very few of them have uh, gone through rhetoric, and so they're not, they haven't gone through the class of how to do a polished speech, and so this, this may be the first time they've gone up in public and spoken on a microphone, um, and so tonight's about them and their project, and so we're not looking to, this is not a senior thesis or a senior oral. Um, so uh, with that, I'm gonna ask you guys to give um, a round of applause to just all the, all the winners for tonight. <laughs> Okay, so in our first round of um, our first tier is uh, the honorable mentions. And so um, 
Mr. Puri and I were a little behind on our vernacular um, and our, our MH parlance this year, and so um, I'll, I'll blame it on Mr. Puri. Um, he didn't have the microphone yet. Uh, so uh, the normally this would be called the, the honorable mentions, and so the honorable mentions were the, the projects that uh, uh, the, kind of the third tier of the winners. So these are the dean's list. These are the ones that, the, that we as deans nominated and presented to the judges. And so we have four honorable mentions. Um, and so uh, the first, first one that I'm gonna talk about is, is Mitchell Fisher. Um, Mitchell was in eighth grade and for biology, uh, Miss Lord's class, uh, he did a biomes project, and our, all our honorable mentions are over here in the in the corner, um, underneath that Michelangelo painting, and uh, I guess the, the other painting of Jesus washing Peter's feet. And so, um, so he did these biomes where he created four four biomes, a uh, 3D models, um, each featuring a separate. Um, each featuring the environment, the habitat, the life forms, the ecosystems, and other features uh, within within those biomes. And so, uh, I think that's a really, really impressive jello mold over there of the of, uh, of the ocean. And so, so you guys can walk and check that out um, uh, at the at the end of tonight. Um, the next uh, honorable mention um, is Julia Lankdo. Um, you will get to hear from her in a little bit. Um, with another project that she did, but um, for her eighth grade, Julia's in eighth grade, and for Great Books One, Miss Welch's class, uh, Julia uh, did uh, a series of portraits of Greek gods and goddesses, and so Julia painted individual portraits of several of the major Greek gods and goddesses, and she added different features and incorporated um, some different mediums uh, to create um, just a unique effect to highlight not only the, the image of what those gods and goddesses look like, but also to kind of feature and draw out some of their the character of each of those those deities. Um, the third project that received honorable mention was a uh, was a dual project. Um, Sarah Friedman and Melissa Fu, who were sophomores um, in my Great Books Three class, um, they did something that was pretty unique of creating a Hamlet puppet show. So they filmed uh, uh, an entire puppet show of. Hamlet and brought um, a, a good bit of, of whimsy um, to the, to all the, the stoicism of to be or not to be, um, and so they brought William Shakespeare's tragedy to life, and then they they edited their film too, which uh, took took a good bit of work as well. And then uh, the the fourth and final honorable mention is Mia Lynn Cochran. Cochran. Uh, Mia Lynn's a freshman in Great Books Two in Mr. Acuff's Great Books Two class. And she did the, a, a very interesting project that should be near and dear to a lot of you, especially if you were a child of the 70s and 80s, um, called What's Behind the Force? And so Mia Lin did extensive research into what the philosophical and religious traditions around, um, around the world um, that, were in, that inspired uh, George Lucas, who was the creator of Star Wars, what inspired his concept of the Force. And so she brings in um, a lot of information from Aristotle's prime mover, Christianity, Buddhism, Chinese philosophy, um, and stories from the Greek and Nordic traditions, and then just does some extensive research of saying, here's where this, here's where this element of the Force or this this part of Star Wars comes from. And so you can really see her passion for Star Wars um, that uh, was, I guess, passed down from her by her Jedi mom. Um, and so uh, you can look at that. Um, the, the information that she had over there and, and can see that. And so those are um, our four projects that were, were honorable mentions. And so um, with this, we're gonna move into kind of the second category of, of winners. And these are judges finalists. And so these are ones that the judges said, these are these are projects that we, we want to recognize of, um, uh, of, of recognizing that these went above and beyond um, and so we've got, I'm gonna, Mr. Pree and I are gonna do a little bit of a tap dance of, I'll present a couple, he'll present a couple. And, uh, and so if you, when we call your name as a finalist, if you um, would come up here and uh, we can recognize you and your project and give you, um, give you your certificate. And so, uh, Mr. Pree, could you bring um, Ms. Callie Doak's uh, feminism project, feminism through the years project. And Callie, can you come up here?
So this is Cali Doe. Um, Cali, how many times have you been up, up here over the, over the years? Okay, so she's, she's three for three. Um, there's several three for three folks tonight. Um, so Callie is a junior um, and was, uh, and it still is in my American history class. And so this was her unique project for, for American history. And she did um, a project called Feminism Through the Years. And so what Callie did was she took an in-depth look at um, the movement, really the three movements of of feminism, and so she looked at the, the evolution of how feminism um, has developed in American history from 1848 to the present. And so she specifically looked at three different waves of feminism, um, uh, and what the what each of those waves of feminism, who their leaders were, what their values were, what their goals were, and and what the what their results or achievements or accomplishments were. And so, and then she wrote a report um, of her findings and then created this this bulletin board to kind of give a visual aid um, highlighting each of those waves. And so uh, these are some of the things that the judges said specifically about, about Callie's project. Um, they said, uh, great work, I enjoyed reading your, and then that was kind of all caps, um, your opinions and not just what someone else said about feminism. Uh, this is a highly interesting and very educational project. Uh, another judge said, I like learning about the variations of each wave. Um, they assumed that it was all just kind of one thing. And then uh, the, the fourth judge said, Callie does an incredible job by ta of tackling a very big topic in our culture today, and there's a clear passion behind her pursuit. And so, uh, so Callie, here is your certificate for this project. So thank you very much. All right, next up, we have another um, three-time uh, award winner. So this is Harper Hightower. So Harper, if you can come up here. So Harper Hightower is a junior, um, and she uh, took uh, is Mrs. McQueen's American history student, and uh, she read a book called Up From Slavery, and, and so what Harper did was she read Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery, and created a collage on a canvas representing different ideas from the book. Um, Booker T. Washington is, is one, of my, one of my heroes. If you guys don't know who he is, he's uh, basically the Martin Luther King of the of the 1890s, um, and he founded uh, Tuskegee Institute, which was the first all-black college. And so um, the, the symbolism in this collage displays um, depth and creativity. Slavery um, was obviously a very tragic um, of event and, and movement and element within American history, and Harper's project shows how a very important historical figure overcame that. Um, and so, uh, with, uh, with the judges' comments, they said not only did Harper read the book, but also created a piece that artistically and beautifully tied together uh, what, what she learned. And so, um, again, I would strongly encourage you guys to, um, if you're interested in this, to, to read, pick up that book and read Up From Slavery. It's very inspiring. And so, Harper, uh, here is here's your certificate. Thank you. enough of me and we're going to let Mr. Faria come up here. Uh, what Mr. Schumann didn't uh, inform you of is that I'm actually the editor of a lot of the emails that he writes, so if there was... Um, if there was a, a typing error, I'm actually going to blame it on uh, the Dean of Arts and Humanities over there. So, so uh, uh, I get to recognize uh, two more award winners uh, from the math science side. And uh, the first one um, is, uh, has 
filled a, a unique role this year that um, I'm not even sure she set foot on campus. So uh, this award goes to Kira Cochran, uh, who's an eighth grader in biology this year. Uh, she's watching from home, so uh, you guys can give her a, a hand as though she's watching up here. So also, this is a difficult one to uh, show you a binder full of science experiment notes, but we're gonna do our best. So Kira, um, uh, did a project on the, let's see if I can get this up here, on the efficacy of different types of antibiotics um, uh, uh, as they uh, battled against probiotics. And so um, she has a pretty interesting study up here that I've, uh, I guess I took some pictures of that you'd be welcome to come up here and look at as well. Um, one of the judges commented that uh, he was a little nervous that she was uh, finding prescription drugs somewhere and wasn't sure how she got her hands on all these things. And I spoke with uh, her mother this week and found out that her dad is a chemist, so uh, I do understand that they were legally acquired, so that was good to find out. Try to give a more telling summary than that. Uh, her tutor says that she constructed an, appear, uh, an experiment uh, with a hypothesis and a lab report uh, with amazing talent. She very thoroughly explained her steps, including her materials, and documented her results. Uh, her efforts were detailed and intentional throughout the entire report. Um, when I was speaking with her mother about this project, um, uh, her mother told me that she entered this in uh, the state science fair last year, kind of a, sim a simpler version of this, and it actually received uh, a top five in the state. Uh, award last year, so that's a big deal. So, but yeah, we can give her a hand for that. Uh, her, the, um, the judges said that it was a great application of the scientific method. It was very detailed and rigorous, and uh, again, that judge was relieved to find out that he, uh, her dad was a chemist. Um, so, uh, so, well done, Kira. Congratulations. Um, okay, next. Uh, yeah, we can give her another hand. So next we do have this young lady here with us, and it's another biology student, and it is Julia Lankto. So come on up, Julia. I'll let you stand over here near your project. So uh, uh, Julia is an eighth grader in biology with Mr. McDuffie, and uh, Julia's project, uh, uh, hopefully there's not a spelling test about this, it's called Epigenetics why eating well matters. And so uh, Julia prepared a, I think, 1,000 slide PowerPoint uh, presentation, <laughs> printed in full color, so thanks dad and mom for that. And uh, so, so she kind of gives the, uh, a summary of what's happening in the US health system now. I guess I'll read what her tutor said. Uh, it's on the importance of eating well and the benefits to individuals and society as a whole, which expanded on the topics that they've studied in class, diet and nutrition, health and the environment. So uh, she provided lots of interesting stats. Uh, there's a huge bibliography at the end. Uh, just talks about some of the things that are happening in uh, um, the uh, Western diet currently. Uh, that is an interesting acronym for the standard American diet. I'm sure it's not an accident. Um, and, uh, and so, um, but then she offers a solution uh, with Bob the Tomato and company. And so, and uh, the, the solution that she puts forth is the whole food plant-based diet. So I'm sure she would have a lot to say about that. Um, she's, she's a great uh, athlete and dancer. And so um, some of the comments that, uh, that she had in here uh, as she addressed some of the common objections that people have to uh, this type of diet um, uh, was that uh, there really is enough nutrition in this type of eating, uh, uh, even for um, an elite athlete. So, uh, there's lots of interesting information in here. The judges said, uh, um, one judge uh, really liked all the information but was hoping you could bring up some counterpoints. Um, I think, think he was maybe feeling guilty that he didn't eat this way, so he was, he was hoping that a cheeseburger pizza diet had some advantages too. Um, another judge said, uh, informative and amazing, well done. So uh, Julia, well done on your project and congratulations. So we've got, uh, for our next project, of Caroline Christopher. And so Mr. Free is gonna start getting some of this up on the TV for me because um, 
I'm technologically challenged. I guess it's four one for the dark arts. <laughs> so Caroline is in uh, eighth grade, and she's in Great Books One with Mrs. Shelburne, and uh, her she did a really unique take on Cinderella. Um, and so what Mrs. Shelburne said is that Caroline uh, has been learning sign language um, and has a passion for it and wanted to increase her knowledge and vocabulary um, in, in signing. And so what she did to, for her project, she signed the fairy tale Cinderella and made a video of her narrating and, and signing this famous story as the pages of the book were turned in the background. So I'll um, let... So that, this goes on for eight and a half minutes. Um, so this is a, a very impressive piece. And so uh, some of the, the comments that the judges made about your project, this is um, a nice job reimagining this timeless story. Uh, the narrative, um, uh, or, sorry, uh, this, this took place beyond um, the required hours to complete. I mean, so I mean, this, this took a long time to do, and her passion is very evident in her retelling. Uh, and then Caroline is obviously a hard worker, and that they really loved your expression as you're, as you're getting to, sh uh, to share about, about Cinderella. And so, Caroline, here you are. With your <laughs> And we have another Great Books One uh, winner coming up. We have uh, Christelle Katata. And so I'll let you hold this. So what Christelle did for her Great Books One uh, class, also with Mrs. Shelburne, was she wrote um, a story called An Argive Adventure. And so this is what Mrs. Shelburne said in describing this project, is that Christelle cleverly weaves her knowledge of Homer's Iliad and her writing skills together in this project. In her story, the main character is an MCA senior who travels back in time to the Trojan War, and her character observes events from his perspective and, uh, and makes a few adjustments to the epic's outcome. And she said that you'll have to read both uh, the Iliad and Christelle's book to, to learn the difference of, of what, what the different challenge and different uh, outcomes are on that. And so the judges said um, that this young lady has an amazing ability to write and then uh, put wow, 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 like three different times on it in, in caps. Um, it says the narrative was consistent um, as it went through over 60 pages and well done. And, uh, and it just, you did a very good job of reimagining re this timeless story. And so, Christelle, great job on an archive adventure. Just a few too many props here for me to keep up with. I was hoping Mr. Sheeman would be a better Vanna White. But that's what I'm too ugly. All right, so this project is for another young lady who uh, is not with us tonight. Uh, she's just across campus at the grammar school. Um, she. Uh, didn't consult us before she planned her senior uh, celebration party uh, tonight, her graduation party. So uh, this this project is Casey Miller's. Um, so let's give her a hand. So Casey's a 12th grader in anatomy class with Miss Lord. And uh, as you can tell, her project is on the facial muscle, muscles. Um, that's a hard thing to say. Say that five times fast, okay? Uh, Casey covered all four categories of wonder, imagination, discover, and arete. Uh, this is what her um, tutor said a hundred times over. She hand painted all the muscles of the face, 
while accurately in color and location identified their scientific name. Her work brought to life the text images that she was shown in class, and her painting is amazing. Right? Uh, so the panel, uh, as they described it, said Casey's love for learning can be clearly seen in her artistic output, yet she displays a sense of discovery as the work is biologically accurate. Uh, it's a, another judge said it's a very intricate visual. Um, it's Grey's Anatomy type work, not the TV show. Um, uh, would love to see the purpose of each muscle explained. So uh, this is this is a magnificent painting, and let's give another hand for Casey. I will welcome to the stage uh, Leah Speed. Come on up, Leah. I think, was Casey, has she been up here all three years as well? Or just two? She's been up here all three. She's been up here all three? What about you? Okay, yeah, so this is Leah's third time up here. So well done, Leah. Uh, so uh, this project was uh, for anatomy class as well. And because it's a bit difficult to show, I took a few photos so you could enjoy it. Um, hopefully you won't have to put any of this into practice anytime soon. Uh, it's called the basics of trauma response for the everyday man. So if you find yourself in a situation where uh, trauma has been experienced, uh, you uh, would be glad if you had Leah's project in your purse um, or wallet. Okay? So uh, maybe she can print you a wallet sized version of this. Sold in pocket size next year <laughs> and store near you. So her tutor described it this way. Leah took her love for learning and clear passion for trauma response. Very interesting passion, Leah and beautifully outlined a very stressful yet important few moments following a traumatic experience. Through the book with these hand-drawn diagrams, so um, I was quite impressed the, uh, at her skills, uh, and clearly explained steps she made trauma response understandable for the everyday man. As it's related to anatomy, you as the reader are brought into the intricacies of the human body and how efficient and accurate responses must be. So uh, one of the judges said that uh, simple solutions are really what you need in a traumatic event, and you hit that target with precision. Uh, another judge said, uh, incredible drawings, great work. Um, another judge said, you had a clear love of learning when putting this together, very informative and concise. So Leah, it was awesome, well done, congratulations. So for uh, our next uh, finalist, we have Anthony Scaglioni, who's a freshman. So Anthony, come on up here. <laughs> Could we let Anthony hold this? Yeah. That way if it like, catches on fire or something, it's on to you. So, so Anthony is a freshman here at Midland Classical, and in Greek 1, Mr. Patterson's Greek 1 class, he did Revelation Scrolls. And so what uh, Mr. Patterson says is that Anthony translated three chapters of Revelation uh, from English to, into Greek, which is kind of backwards, um, and then created this scroll so that he distressed the paper so that it resembles ancient parchment with flaws and imperfections due to aging. And what this project does is it enhanced uh, Anthony's Greek vocabulary and syntax as well as his, his knowledge and familiarity with, with Revelation. And so uh, the judges comment said that Anthony not only beautifully presents parts of Revelation, but he takes on the task, uh, a task that is academically profound. Um, another judge said, in spite of it, this was kind of, a, I guess, the, the headlines right here. So here's, here's what you can put on the back of your book. Um, inspiring, artistic, thoughtful. Uh, your handwriting is impressive. Um, visually creative. I really like that you translated this back into Greek, which is a hard skill to master. 
Anthony, uh, set that back on the table and I'll give you your certificate. Thank you. all my props, but I forgot my notes. Okay, next up uh, is a, a math student, um, Nathan Swallow. Come on up, Nathan. You can stand on this side of me. So Nathan uh, tried to answer one of the deep existential questions of life, who is the greatest basketball player of all time, and applied his algebra knowledge to answer that question. So. Here's uh, what, um, uh, or who's the second greatest basketball player of all time behind J.B., I think is really what the question is. Uh, so uh, his tutor says that um, Nathan compiled career stats for four NBA legends, uh, Kobe, MJ, Wilt Chamberlain, and LeBron, of course. Um, so then using a formula that Nathan developed, uh, he calculated which player should be considered the greatest of all time which is GOAT, for those of you who have been asleep for the last 10 years. Uh, this involved an analysis of averages, uh, career and season averages, and a weighting system that includes team championship. So uh, this is all here in this binder for you to look at and uh, see if you agree with or disagree. So you got your game highs, your lifetime achievements. And then uh, this is the page where all the dirty work happens with uh, uh, what Nathan compiled to come up with the answer. And uh, I'm actually not going to tell you who he said was the greatest of all time. So if you want to find out, you'll have to come up here and read, okay? So um, uh, one judge said a definite wow factor behind this project, uh, the way that Nathan created a formula to determine the GOAT was thorough, insightful, inspired, and intriguing. Uh, another judge said this is the kind of analysis and conclusion drawing that I would hope an engineer at our company could do. So I guess that's maybe a job offer. Uh, very impressive use of data to draw conclusions. So uh, Nathan, congratulations and welcome. All right, uh, next up to honor is Ryan Sturdivant. So Ryan, come on up. And So Ryan is a junior at NCA, thank you Mr. Schumann, and uh, he is in geometry class this year. And uh, we call this project the MCA Campus Blueprint, so you'll have to come up and take a close up look at it. <clears throat> so his tutor says that Ryan took measurements of the upper school here and built a, to, built a to scale model in the architecture design program called Revit. Uh, this project that he did was an extension of a project that geometry students do in class with their own homes. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, Ryan has gotten plenty of practice in this program because it was his summer job uh, doing the same work for the, all the Kinkwick stores um, in the area. So uh, Ryan's MH not only includes the basic structure of the buildings, but it also replicates the interior designs and the furnishings as well. So I can like see the little tiny desk in my office. It's so cute. Uh, it is truly impressive. He printed his work to show a 3D view of the buildings as well as the top view floor plan in uh, that's traditional architecture plans. So one judge said this uh, takes the mega problem and raises it to 11. Uh, for those of you who know that reference, um, what is that movie called? Spinal Tap, there we go. Uh, and then uh, another judge who is actually an architect said, uh, uh, Revit is difficult, very amazing, all caps wow, well done. So Ryan, all caps, wow, well done, congratulations. All right, we now transition into the, uh, the final portion of the evening. 
uh, where we're going to present the Mastery of Honor Award winners, which are the top five uh, vote getters from the judges. Uh, and uh, this is special because you uh, it's time for you to um, uh, get to take a break from hearing Mr. Schumann and myself talk. And uh, each of these five winners are going to get to share themselves when it, when the, what went into their project. They'll present a portion of their project, if applicable. And then we'll also leave time for a small number of questions from the audience, if you have any. Okay. So uh, our first recipient of the 2021 Master's Honor Award um, is Paul McMillan. So come on. <laughs> I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, thunder, but I'll give a quick summary. He's in 11th grade, and this is his chemistry honors project. He did uh, two others, correct? Okay. Uh, Mrs. McQueen is his tutor, and uh, this project, I guess you see the title in there, but it is called MacGyver Chemistry versus Real Chemistry. So Paul uh, has been raised on the classics. He's been watching MacGyver since he was a child. Uh, he replicated three experiments that happened in the original MacGyver TV series. And uh, so you'll hear him describe those, and Mrs. McQueen says that, it, that they do tie into these things learned in chemistry, gas laws, uh, unique properties of water, and atomic excitation. So that sounds pretty exciting. So Paul, take it away, and uh, then I'll add a few things that the judges said as we wrap up. Uh, well, uh, to start off with, uh, what I... What made me want to do this is uh, one day uh, while I was mowing lawns during the summer, um, that morning my mom had said, uh, let's figure out what you're gonna do for uh, MHs before the deadline, like the day before the day before. So I was like, okay, and so I was mowing. I thought, you know what? I love MacGyver and uh, I'm taking chemistry next year, so why don't I just like make a smoke bomb or something? And so when I presented that idea, my mom nixed it on the basis that making bombs was illegal or something. I don't know. Um, so I was like, okay, a little disheartened. Um, I was like, what can I still do with MacGyver? And so I decided, okay, so he has a lot of MacGyver hacks, and that's what the TV series labels it as. And that's just where he um, uses what's around him uh, and his knowledge of chemistry to get out of his, get out of his situation. And so uh, the three things that I chose to do were um, a paper mache hot air balloon that he uses as a signal. A, um, he uses the knowledge that water expands when frozen to pop a lock in a freezer. And also uh, he builds a spectroscope, which I'll explain what that is later. So the first one that I did, uh, I'm just gonna... sorry, this is my first one. It's a little dented now. Um, is I paper mache a hot air balloon. So what went into this is uh, three layers of three layers of tissue paper, uh, flour and water, your traditional uh, paper mache glue, um, and a balloon. And so I blew the balloon up and then uh, paper mache uh, three layers of the tissue paper around it. And then once dry, popped it, and then was just able to pull the balloon out. So, and it, Sorry, and I also used uh, wire and like the base of a red plastic cup and a tea light candle um, to make it work. Uh, because I was trying to prove that hot air rises. Um, some of y'all may have already figured this out. It was way too heavy. Like, you can't really hear it now, but if I bump it against it, it's very loud. So way too heavy. And so I went back to the driving, drawing board, and that's what the black one is. and. I'm not going to crinkle it because it'll. I don't want to break it, but it is super thin. I only used one layer on this one, and I got a um, bigger candle because I thought bigger candle, more heat, the more the more likely it's going to rise. And so I set it all up and lit the candle, and then three seconds later, my balloon was on fire. <laughs> so put it out and thought, you know what? Let's just scrap it. Let's figure something else out. And so instead of doing a paper mache balloon, I decided that I was gonna go for a sky lantern. And if you don't know what that is, and if you've seen Tangled, whenever they're on the boats on the uh, river around the castle of Gabe knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and the uh, lanterns go up, that's what a sky lantern is. So um, using uh, YouTube videos, I used uh, wax paper and uh, a fuel cell, which I'll explain what that is, uh, to build a sky lantern. So it looks like a cylinder uh, with just a cap on top. So, some of y'all are probably wondering what these are. Should I show this one first? So, this 
So this is what's left of it. Um, basically, I made the cylinder and then one part, one side had a cap and the other didn't. And so I would take a piece of wire and then like fold the wax paper around it. So if I held it like this, the lantern would be up here. And then the fuel cell is actually very interesting. Um, I just melted down that candle that burnt my first uh, balloon, so a little bit of revenge. Um, and then um, took a foot long piece of cloth, uh, uh, so I soaked it in the wax, and then uh, the wax combined with the cloth made it burn really, really hot and really, really long. And so I just crossed wires across and then uh, tied the fuel around it and then lit it. The first time I did it, I was on the back porch. Uh, this was before I thought I should probably document this, and I'm kind of sad I didn't. But this is the hottest a fire I've ever been close to because I was here, I lit it, and then the whole thing was on fire. So imagine a two foot tall piece of wax paper, the whole thing is completely on fire. Drop it, get the water hose, and that's what's left of it. So, a little discouraged by that, but I thought, okay, so I'm gonna make it bigger, and that's why uh, the second one is, uh, the circumference is a little bit bigger, just that the fuel cell in the middle would be farther away from the sides of the lantern. Um, sadly, I tried this uh, three or four times, but it never actually took off. And part of that was user error because of, like if it would fall, or if it looked like it was starting to fall, I'd put my hand on top of it so it wouldn't fall, but then it would just keep it down, keep it from rising up. And also uh, with smoke escaping from the top where I didn't glue it down perfectly. Uh, one thing that I did learn from that is something you learned uh, about uh, pressure inside of something, whenever heat is put in, uh, the kinetic energy increases, and so the molecules inside will move faster, hitting the sides of, what, of the container. That's why if you mow lawns, or if you've seen a gas can that's expanded a little bit, that's why it's expanded, it's because the molecule, the gas molecules are hitting the edges of the container. So my second project is, um, I don't really have anything to show for that, but I was trying to prove that uh, water expands when frozen. So MacGyver uses it to pop a lock. I thought, well, I can do that. And so I took a cup and put a just typical ace hardware lock in there. And then it was during the um, ice storm. And so I waited for it to freeze. Two hours later, it's completely frozen, but the lock hasn't popped. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, in MacGyver, it was just a latch that he kind of popped open. In mine, it's got tumblers and there's just, it's more sophisticated. And so I thought that's the reason it didn't work. So instead, I thought, all right, so I just need to show that it expands. And so I put water in a just a little tub and then put it in the freezer and waited for two weeks. When I came back, the uh, top of the ice was a full centimeter above the edge of the cup, but the lid popped off. So the reason um, ice expands that way is because water, when it's just like in a water bottle, the molecules have no specific arrangement. But whenever it freezes, the water molecules are um, separated into uh, hexagon uh, crystalline structures. And so the molecules are farther apart, therefore it's gonna take up more space. For my third and final uh, project, I built a simple spectroscope, which is spectro what a spectroscope does, and uh, well, a spectrograph is it shows how different uh, what elements Um, coming through um, like through the air and with light going through that we can tell um, the size of the wavelength by how big the uh, light is and so if you've ever seen a CD like you've seen the rainbow or whatever and you've played with it a little bit so what this does is I can get it back in here on top if you can see there is a little slit cut in the top and so that is where the light is going to enter so what you do is you stand under a light somewhere and then you look through the uh, people. This we got right over here. <laughs> you look through the people, and inside it'll show you a perfect uh, rainbow, uh, showing what, showing uh, different uh, levels. So you've got red, orange, green, blue, all the way down to violet on my spectroscope. And so, what the CD is doing is it's acting as a prism, and so it's uh, refracting light and splitting it into the so uh, 
what I've learned from uh, doing these projects is two things. One, MacGyver chemistry is definitely not real life chemistry. <laughs> real life is not one take. So that was a little discouraging. The movie Magic went away a little bit for me. But um, it also made me have a very deep respect for chemists and how they can figure out just from uh, like pieces of paper, like really everything around us, how they can figure out the chemistry of it and why it works the way it does. So I had a deprived childhood, Paul. I haven't seen much MacGyver, uh, so I haven't seen the episode where he escaped from the freezer. Did it take him two weeks to pop the lock too? That would have been a really sad end to MacGyver's career. So. <laughs> So, did you have trouble picking your three experiments uh, out of your MacGyver shows? Uh, no, actually, these were uh, kind of based off what other people have done. And so there was a whole list of MacGyver hacks you can do at home that are safe and legal. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that you chose a legal project to do. Uh, that was wise. So, um, and where did you find a CD? With, uh, have you been to the Smithsonian recently? <laughs> Okay, uh, well, what questions from the audience do you uh, do you guys have about his project? Anything? Well, Paul, you gave a very thorough uh, explanation of your project, and we certainly enjoyed it. Um, so uh, congratulations for being a, a 2021 awards recipient. Well done. Next up this evening, uh, we had a, a change of plans after hearing um, after hearing Paul's life lessons about choosing projects carefully and wisely. Um, uh, the next one up here will be Lucas Lacey. Um, so come on up, Lucas. So Lucas uh, had a great idea of a project and asked his mom. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, putting some pieces together here. Um, uh, and he asked his mom if he could build stuff to blow it up, and his mother said no, but he did it anyway. <laughs> so uh, this project is for chemistry with Mrs. McQueen, and uh, uh, it's titled The Chemistry of Model Rocket Engines. Um, uh, so the tutor says that uh, Lucas uh, determined the chemical reaction that takes place in a model rocket engine. He then built an engine experimenting with different materials and used stoichiometry to determine the uh, necessary ratios. This uh, relates directly to what was studied in class. So I don't forget, like I did with Paul, I'll say some of the things that judges said. Uh, the project shows a great love of learning, uh, a great sense of discovery, um, awesome relationship between academic knowledge and real world design. Please use your powers for good. <laughs> All right, uh, so we will let uh, Lucas talk very loudly. So for my chemistry MH project this year, uh, I decided I wanted to build some model rocket engines. Uh, the reason I kind of wanted to go in that direction with it is I've always had a love for model rocketry and all that kind of goes with that. And chemistry kind of seemed like the perfect time to like maybe expand my knowledge on all of that sort of stuff. So to start off my project, I had to do a lot of internet research. And what that entailed was me looking up very risky things like uh, what what pyrotechnic solutions are gonna work the best? And hopefully I don't end up on a watch list for that. <laughs> but, so uh, from, from the research that I did, I found that uh, the, uh, the model rocket engine is just a type of a solid rocket motor. And uh, solid rocket motors uh, go anywhere from like a model rocket to like the uh, solid rocket boosters on the sides of the space shuttle. So you could definitely scale it up. But uh, so uh, they all kind of work the same the same basic way. They have a uh, their propellant is in a solid form, and what the propellant has is it has uh, 
a fuel and then also an oxidizer. So the reaction that takes place once it's ignited, the oxidizer is going to uh, burn and actually produce oxygen, which is then uh, used by the uh, fuel itself. So for my project and uh, kind of through the research that I did, I decided for the fuel I was gonna use uh, sugar and I bought that in the form of like powdered sugar so that way it was like real fine and easy to mix with uh, the oxidizer. And then for the oxidizer, I used uh, sodium nitrate, more commonly known as stump remover. So uh, buying those things, uh, had to make sure to buy from separate stores, wash list. <laughs> but yeah. So, um, so it then came for the, yeah. So for the construction of the actual uh, motor, I decided, so I have all the different parts here, just kind of a little model that I made. So we have the casing. I used uh, like three quarter inch PVC pipe for the casing. And then its purpose is just kind of contain everything, make sure everything goes out the way it's supposed to. And then uh, the seal kind of serves the same purpose. Um, for the seals, I used uh, a really fine clay uh, that I got out of a kitty litter. Again, different store. And then, so, and then the nozzle and everything, I just uh, drilled through so that way everything kind of reacts evenly and you get this nice uh, kind of even flow of thrust through the end of it. So uh, after, so I did construct, uh, I probably constructed like 15 of them, but so I used this little uh, ramrod out of a like three quarter inch wooden dowel and what I would do is I would uh, put the uh, cut PVC segments on like a table or something and then I'd pour in kind of like the measured amounts of clay that I would need and then the measured amounts of propellant and then more clay on the bottom and then I would ram those down and make sure that they were nice and compact. So. And then we got a finished product, which looked like uh, this would be the top of it. So you can see that nice uh, clay seal at the top, and then here's the bottom. So we have the clay seal, and then there's a hole drilled all the way down through kind of the motor itself. And then what you see is a hobby fuse to ignite it with a little this plug in there. So I have a video of one of the first ones that I launched. Or there's it on the ground. I didn't really have the guts to put it going up because I had no idea what it would do. So <laughs> there you go. So that was about half the burn of that one. I, I didn't get the first half because I was, I was lighting it and I didn't want to throw my hand up. But. <laughs> so uh, for the second one, uh, this was one of the last ones I did after I kind of uh, threw in a few improvements like I uh, in between this one and the last one I had a few to where the uh, clay stop would actually pop out because too much pressure build, built up all at once so I did a few things like increasing like the clay thickness and then uh, like adjusting propellant ratios to make it more efficient and yeah so here's one of the last ones that I did and then this one I actually pointed up uh, kind of bad decision That's what I thought it was going to go up. <laughs> yeah, so that, that nervous laugh there at the end kind of sums up the project. <laughs> yeah. uh, I had a lot of fun. Hopefully they still let me on the plane for junior trip. <laughs> yeah, that's what I got. Well done, sir. Uh, so I, you may have said this when I stepped away, but um, I know rocket engines have different classes. Do you know what classes you were building as far as the size that uh, the size this is that you're manufacturing? So uh, kind of if anyone's ever done like model rocketry, like uh, uh, like A would be like the smallest, and then like like F would be like the biggest, like that they, they would sell Hobby Lobby. I would put mine probably at like a G, but yeah, they're pretty big. So, um, uh, what got you interested? Why did you choose this as your project, of all things? Well, I've, I've always had a passion for lighting things on fire. And, <laughs> and then, um, also, I, I really want to pursue a, like a, a career in aerospace. So this kind of seemed as like maybe a practical like step towards that, and maybe something that I can better understand what I'm doing.
what's the most interesting launch that you uh, witnessed firsthand besides, or the second most interesting besides this? Uh, it'd have to be the first commercial launch of the SpaceX Falcon Heavy. We went to the kind of inaugural, inaugural launch of that, and it was, it was pretty cool. I'm sure there was plenty of nervous laughter when that thing went up as well. So. <laughs> uh, okay, questions from the crowd. Anything that you would like to hear uh, from Lucas while he's up here? Yes, sir. So, um, yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, why did I use sugar as fuel? So, uh, sugar doesn't immediately kind of come off as, like, very reactive at all. And, like, if, if you try to burn it with uh, just kind of add, like, in normal conditions, like room temperature, it's not, it's going to make maybe, like, kind of crisp over, kind of, like, caramelize. But whenever you add in that, like, uh, the actual oxidizer, like, some, like, sodium nitrate, and you're constantly feeding in the oxygen to it, then it becomes pretty, pretty more reactive. And then that's what uh, uh, was able to, like, kind of sustain that, the level of thrust that I was able to use. And mainly just a lot of research, but. All right, well, Lucas, congratulations. It was a great topic. <laughs> All So Diana, you can come on over here a little closer. So Diana um, is the first person we've ever had that has got two awards on the same night. So she's a top five for two different classes. So she'll, you'll see her again tonight. So for her first um, MH award uh, was for Mr. Acuff's World History II class. And these are abstract art interpretations. And so what Diana did was she researched various forms and styles of abstract art uh, that they learned about in the World History II class, um, and in addition to some other artists and styles from the same period that the, the class didn't cover. And so what she did was then she created eight, and I guess this is also part of the abstract thing, because I actually counted nine different panels, um, but she created eight uh, of her own paintings um, inspired by the styles that she researched, and these include abstract expressionisms of Jackson Pollock, uh, Wassily Kandinsky, as well as the Cubism of Pablo Picasso, and, and maybe even, even though this isn't mentioned here, with maybe like a little Salvador Dali with some surrealism. Um, and so uh, these are some of the things that the judges said about your project, is that there's a great range of interpretation. It's really cool to see how distinct different types of abstract art styles can be. Uh, another judge said, I like the effect of the different styles. Um, after comparing them for a while, a pattern and a design begins to emerge through the abstractions. Um, and then another said, this potentially belongs in a museum. And so with that, I'll let you take it away and tell us about um, what you did.
Okay, so in world history too, a lot of the subject matter that's covered is over different art and artists. And I've loved art since I was little, but I'd never taken much of a look into abstract art until this year. And I really became interested in it and just mostly thought it was really fun to look at. So I decided to delve a little bit deeper. So I have a definition for y'all. Abstract art is art that doesn't attempt to represent external reality, but seeks to achieve effects using shapes, colors, and textures. And because of that, this looks really appealing. I could stare at most of these, most artists' paintings for hours. So I went about creating them in a bit of a different way. Mr. Timmon mentioned um, most of the artists that they're inspired by, but um, I guess I'll just go through the line of uh, each painting and kind of what they're inspired by. These two were inspired, you might be able to tell, by Jackson Pollock. Um, these were probably the least technique-based and honestly most fun. Basically, you just mix color, splatter it on a canvas. A lot of the stuff I did was I would just take the paint and throw it, and we actually ended up getting a lot of paint on our fins. The fans were very happy about that. Um, I would take a canvas and just chunk it across the yard, and that's how they turned out. So my, probably my two favorites that I ended up making were both inspired by the Russian artist Vlasly Kaminsky. Um, the first one was inspired by circles. I, I bet you couldn't guess which one that is. <laughs> um, the, the format is quite similar to the original one, but I created completely my own color scheme, which was fun and interesting to do, and I ended up mixing the colors of the paint and blending them a lot more than in the original one. And then this one is probably my favorite. It's also inspired by Wassily Kaminsky and just his um, entire technique and uh, process in general. He uses a lot of open circles and shapes and lines and just kind of merges them together to create a painting. And that's kind of what I did here. I didn't have a plan when I first started it, but it, I ended up creating kind of a story as I went along. So the triangles to me represent like ships that are coming and sailing through, and it's almost like they're coming up to the stars, and I call it Stairway to Heaven. And then. and mainly just by the style of cubism in general. And the definition of cubism is uh, all possible viewpoints are shown at once using geometrical shapes. And this one, I actually created the background and the, the main part separately, and, the, and then afterwards decided they looked better together, so I just stuck it on. <laughs> and then this one was actually it took a lot longer to make than I expected it to. I cut out shapes in paper and then traced it and then filled in each individual color and line to create this shape effect. And then the last and another very fun um, technique that I used was acrylic core paintings inspired by the technique by David a Laparo Securus, or something like that. <laughs> and basically, it's a technique where you have a bunch of just clear acrylic medium and acrylic paint, and you mix the colors however you want and pour them in different ways into cups, and then just pour them on the painting and spread it out. And it actually was a lot harder than I thought it would be. It was kind of harder than it looks, because the paint just kind of spreads together and muddles. But these were eventually what I created. I went with an elements inspired theme. So this is fire, space, and then over here is earth. So that's kind of what I came up with and I really enjoyed these three. Yeah.
the shine yet. So, uh, so you said that um, these, the Jackson Pollocks on the far end were the easiest for you to paint. Which one was the hardest? All right, what questions do you guys have? What is your favorite medium to use? Great question. Uh, the one I'm most ex uh, experienced with is acrylic paint. That's what all of this is. But recently, I've been really liking oil painting. Liking oil painting? Yeah. That works. Close enough. Any other questions? Dave. Art that was most new to me that we learned about and also I've just always liked looking at it and I was like oh this is cool I'll try this so. have you what other paintings have you done that have not been abstract oh uh, just kind of whatever I'm feeling I do we did a project in world history where we pick a painting and then just a painting style and do that and for that one I believe I picked post-expressionism, and that was of a dancer who was in a mountain range, so that's an example. Mrs. Perea. So for those of us who are less sophisticated and haven't learned to appreciate modern art as much and abstract art, do you have any tips to appreciate it better? So I'll summarize that question. For those of us that are not familiar with abstract art, do you have any tips to help the rest of us be able to appreciate it better? Um, I think obviously everyone's going to have a different opinion and if you don't like it, that's totally fine. But I guess just looking at it and just seeing if there's anything about it that you like or enjoy or appreciating. I think a lot of times people think that abstract art just like is done just because and no thought or work was put into it. And oh, definitely for some of that it's true. But for some of it, it is inspired. Uh, I think especially like the Wasley Kaminsky ones, they do have thought behind them. All right, well, thank you very much, Diana. So here is your certificate. Next up is Hudson Beard. Hudson, come on up. <laughs> Hudson is in eighth grade. He is tall. <laughs> he uh, did several projects, but the one he's receiving an award for this year is uh, Algebra One with Mrs. Snell. Uh, this uh, program, or the, the name of this project was uh, the uh, Python Problem Solver. So summary uh, from his tutor is that Hudson taught himself Python and then created a program that solves basic algebra problems. So every eighth graders dream. <laughs> so from factoring to finding the slope of a line, Hudson's program can solve many types of problems. His hope is to use this skill to grow a deeper understanding of algebra and other math, math classes he takes and hopes to help other students marvel at math. I was telling my uh, seventh graders about this project and they're like, I wonder if I could pay him to help <laughs> me do math. So he, he could be a, an entrepreneur soon. All right, Hudson, uh, tell us about your project.
So this is my Uncle Roy image, and uh, so what did I do for this image? Well, he already gave a pretty good description of it, but uh, through my programming knowledge, I automated some of the more difficult concepts of Algebra 1. Um, I use a language called Python, that's its logo right there, and I created this program that will solve most all equations from eighth grade. Um, because I had to teach a computer how to work through these steps, I got these subjects permanently drilled into my memory, for better or for worse. Um, I also improved on my last Algebra 1 and Algebra Half image. Last year, seventh grade me built a program that could do a little bit of the seventh grade math. And uh, this year, I made a completely different program that incorporated some of the functions, but was completely different. And uh, could solve more eighth grade equations. And I plan to keep on adding on to this program through my senior year and eventually sell it to some civvies. Um, um, don't quote me on that. So since, since I was programming in seventh grade, that raises the question, how long have I been doing this? Well, I've had an interest in programming since about third grade. And that's when I started learning. It went from HTML to Java to now Python, which is what I'm most comfortable with. And my mom bought me my first book. And these are the, all the books I own right now. But I'm really weird when it comes to reading. See, I won't read fantasy, but these, these are like the Lord of the Rings to me. They, I've read cover to cover every single one of them. All right, um, now how, in the, how did I do this? I, I taught a computer how to walk through an equation like a human does and how I would do it on my graph paper. Um, and in, show, in making a computer understand what to do, I realized how amazingly complex your brain is because your brain will take a couple of steps that you don't even realize you took, but for a computer, it won't do anything until you tell it to do something. But you can't just say solve an equation. You've got to walk it through every single combination possible that could show up in an equation for it to work. So now that I've been bragging on my program a little bit, let me show you what's, what it is. So here it is right here. Um, we've got three, we've got um, five uh, different uh, functions that it can perform, three of which I created in seventh grade year and two of which I created this year. Um, the ones I created this year were far more complex and took way more time than all three of the other ones combined. So now I'm gonna give you a little bit of a demonstration. So I'm gonna go for a solve for x. And I'm gonna enter a simple equation that equal that x would be equal to two, just so that we can test its um, capabilities. I push okay and it says x is equal to two. Now, um, it doesn't have to be x, despite the, what the button is called. I can change it to A, and it'll find the letter, and then change it. Now, um, it doesn't have to be this simple. It can be even more complicated if I need it to be, and it'll still solve it. Um, and then we've also got graph equation, which it will solve simple equations that uh, you learn in eighth grade. So we've got, uh, we've got this equation right here, and we push OK, and it comes up, and there's a graph with the line. And um, you can move around, see exactly where it hits, just to make sure that you put it down on your homework right. Um, so you can tell that it exactly hits on 5.0. Um, uh, then we've got factorize, which it'll factorize some numbers. And it, it, it can handle some pretty big numbers. Um, and so now that you've seen what my program does, I'm gonna show you a little bit into the source code. Um, not too much. <laughs> so this is about a quarter of the source code and this is the science behind it. This is where all of the math is performed. Um, so like, like I said, this is, a quarter of the, this is a quarter of the source code and as you can see, we've got solve for x where you give it an equation and it gives it back. Um, now I'm gonna go back to my presentation. All right, um, now, despite the ones and zeros that you just saw from my presentation, 
It's not as complicated as you might think it could be. Uh, just like math or any other language, you just have to learn it, and uh, then it becomes simpler. So programming, Python, to me, is a second language. Uh, I read it, write it, understand it. Um, branching off of that, here's a piece of sample, simple code that um, using basic logic, you can uh, say, oh, that makes sense. Um, and so why in the world would I ever spend so much time on a computer? Uh, so I, I would bet that everyone in here uh, has used Python not, without knowing it every day. So here are a couple of applications that Python is used in. Google, Dropbox, Instagram. Uh, it runs in the background of Netflix. It runs almost all of YouTube and 21% of Facebook. So if you use any of these applications, you're using Python, which is what I'm learning to do. There's also a, many career options to this uh, with, for someone with this knowledge, like software developer, quality assurance engineer, game producer, data scientist, machine learning engineer. The oil business uses Python. There's some opportunity out here. Um, logistics management and hacker. <laughs> or ethical hacker. Um, and that's about all I have. Uh, is there any questions? She asked, um, is this the same programming I use for robotics? And the answer is no. I actually use a different language for that, but I'm also, uh, I'm also comfortable using that one. Yeah? How many languages do you know? Uh, four? So his question was, is there a limit to how complicated I could program equations into this? And the answer is no. As long as I can do it, the program can do it. Because it's just walking through like a human would. Is there any other language you can learn? Uh, the question was, are there any other languages I would like to learn? And yes, I think I would like to get into C++. Yes? Um, the question was, why do I like coding? And it's just like any other hobby, like basketball. It's just, I just, that's where I fi find fun. I mean, it's favorite pastime. Yes? He did come to my office a couple months ago triumphantly and said, I know the school Wi-Fi password. Like, Don't you dare tell anyone. So, uh, so I hope that he keeps in mind this whole ethical portion of the hacking thing that he is speaking about. So. Uh, a few things that the judges said about uh, Hudson's project. Uh, the project is incredible. Um, this guy took a Python class in college, and there's no way that I could have come close to building even this. I am amazed. Um, uh, somebody says Python is a great skill to have. Uh, come work for me someday. And, and uh, this is an inc this is incredible, an amazing accomplishment, said this judge. So, um, and uh, uh, this guy it really demonstrates a love for learning. If you can't tell, he comes to my office is like, look at, and now for my next trick, put another number in here. Watch what happens. So, uh, Hudson, that was great, and congratulations. Well done. All right, well, we are moving into our final project of the evening, and uh, uh, as Mr. Schumann mentioned, this is the first time that we've had a, a, a dual recipient for the uh, Master of Honor Awards. So Diana Keeler, come on back up here. So, uh, let's see, I guess we'll grab your project, Diana. 
one of the slow developing projects. So, Diana, you can hold it up and show it off. It's less impressive. Uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to use your imagination on this one. So, uh, or you, you need a couple of other props to, um, to fully realize it, which we will uh, use in a moment. So uh, her tutor describes it as saying, Diana took the lesson on polarization and created, uh, created this dynamic art project. She utilized a polarized computer monitor, a, gra a glass frame, cellophane tape, and polarized glasses to create a window into the physics principle of polarization. All right, so go ahead and carry it back over there. I'm gonna uh, demonstrate it through my phone here. Uh, Mr. Shuma's gonna help me. Come on up, Mr. Shuma. But go ahead and set it in front of that, uh, uh, that monitor back there. Oops, I unplugged the Apple TV a moment ago. Don't ever unplug stuff in the middle of a presentation, lesson learning. Okay, here we go. And now for Diana's next trick. All right, Mr. Schumann, come on over. You'll just aim the camera at the monitor over here. Yep. Okay. Enjoy. Impressive. Okay. Why don't you take one? Oh, and then hold that in front of your, uh, in front of the lens there. Okay. Okay. And again, please. Okay, so in physics this year, we did a unit on light and optics, and part of the unit, Mrs. Westfall gave us some tape and told us to put it on the plastic part of the binder on our notebook, and she gave us these filters and showed us that using a screen, we could create different colors with it. And I thought that maybe I could use this to create something a little bit cooler, and that's where the idea for this image came in. So the idea behind polarized light, light travels in wavelengths in waves. So there are different forms that this can come in. The normal like light that we see just in general is unpolarized light and it's where the waves just scatter throughout an area. But when you have a filter or something to polarize the light, it can make the wavelengths into um, a singular direction. Um, so we can see this utilized in this project um, using different plastic materials. So the reason this works is uh, cheap plastic illustrates this phenomenon because light bends with imperfections of the plastic. And using a filter with a screen allows us to see these imperfections and linearly polarizes the light through the plastic. So as far as the creative process goes, um, we decided on a picture frame because that would just be more aesthetic and I put the tape directly onto the glass. It took quite a while because you, I had to lay out the tape and then cut out each in individual piece and then lay it out in the design. The problem was the tape doesn't show up very well 
with only one layer. So each piece is layered about seven times on the frame to make it show it use that kaleidoscope effect. Um, if, if you can't tell, it's, it's kind of hard to see the design, but it's supposed to be a human face and the skull is what is exploding out the back. And I, I titled it The Mind of a Physics Student because this is kind of how my brain has felt throughout the whole year. Very painful. <laughs> so um, I thought setting it up would cause a bit of a problem because you have to have a screen behind the glass and the tape with the filter in order for it to really have that colorful effect. But Mr. Priya was gracious enough to set up a monitor in the resource center, center so that we were able to have a filter on hand and people were able to see it. So yeah, that's about all. Okay, so um, uh, let's see, Diana. Um, uh, well, I guess I'll make one comment and we can ask a couple questions, but um, I guess this is a great illustration of discovery uh, as you experience every day in physics, having your mind explode. And uh, it's, it's also um, uh, one of my, uh, I guess another great accomplishment that you have is uh, to be up here for an arts and humanities project and a math science project. And so the way that you blended um, science with beauty was really magnificent here, so well done. Uh, what questions do you guys have in the audience? Yeah, go ahead. How long do you think it took you to cut out the shapes of the tape? Um, the question was how long it took me to cut out the pieces of tape. Honestly, I have no idea. Spring break. <laughs> Just I, I spaced it out through spring break, so I don't know. And there's little bits of those tapes all over our house. <laughs> tapes all over the house and probably all over the fence with the paint. So <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, she, she mentioned that I set this one up, um, uh, and uh, I set it up on one of those computer desks over there, and I didn't anticipate this, but it was really good planning on my part to put it right outside of my office, because that, uh, that ooh-ah factor that you guys have when it's like, okay, why is that thing in front of that monitor? Here, hold this. And they're like, what is happening? You know, ex please explain this to me. And so it was really fun to, to see uh, people's minds being blown by Diana's project. So any other questions from the audience? All right, well, Diana, congratulations and well done. I shared this scripture um, the last time that we did this two years ago. Actually, we got a big hailstorm two years ago when we did this. I don't know if any of y'all were uh, here on April 23rd, but that was quite memorable. Um, but uh, this is from the book of Proverbs 22, 29. It says, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will not stand. He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. And I think uh, this night is a great uh, um, encapsulation of that with our students. It's not just these 16 students or 20 students that we recognize tonight, but there, uh, as Mr. Schumann said at the beginning of the day, there are a lot of ways that students can be excellent or that we can be excellent by using our gifts and discovering greatness um, in, the, in the world that um, God has placed us in and using the gifts that he's given each of us. So uh, it's been a fantastic evening to celebrate uh, these students and their hard work. And uh, um, I know that, that uh, behind every um, completed project, there is a support staff of, of parents who serve as gophers and counselors and uh, enforcers and all of those things. So dads and moms, well done for supporting your students in this. I also wanted to thank the the men and women who uh, helped provide all of our refreshments for this evening. So let's give them a hand. And uh, I do encourage you to stick around. Uh, maybe you can meet one of these people and uh, get a picture of them before they become your boss in about 10 years. Um, and uh, uh, grab some. Uh, there's coffee and drinks over here. Uh, there's cookies and snacks over here. And uh, let me close this in prayer and we will be done. God, thank you for this evening and a chance to celebrate uh, these excellent people um, for the ways that they've used their gifts, for the ways that they uh, 
um, just look at the world with eyes of wonder and inspire us. Um, God, I pray that we will all um, uh, go out of here and seek to be um, excellent in the in the field where you have us. And uh, and thank you for this great world that that you created um, and that we get to enjoy. Um, we love you and we uh, thank you. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.